So the foods we eat reveal who we are and how we relate as members of modern tribes, cultures, and countries, often in really surprising ways. Now, I'm a fascinated food sociologist, almost an etologist. I'm a New Zealand artist living in Brooklyn who uses visual concepts and photography to show what the food we eat says about us. I like to use food as the common denominator between the viewer and the subject. So today I'm gonna to show you three photo series that I've done where you'll probably have nothing in common with the subjects of these series, but through their culinary choices, you'll be able to gain a deeper understanding of who these people are. Now in 2011, Texas abolished the last meal privilege for uh, prisoners on death row. As I read about this, I read this chilling list of what they were actually were ordering as their last meals. And for the first time, this whole barbaric process was humanized in my mind. I didn't know the people being executed, but I was able to relate to them because I understood the food they were tasting in these final moments. I also knew what it tasted like. John Wayne Gacy, a manager of three KFC restaurants. For his last meal request, he asked for comfort food. Fried chicken, fried shrimp, and French fries. We've got Ricky Ray Rector, who was actually mentally disabled, so should never have been on death row, but he couldn't actually afford proper legal counsel to defend this. He asked for uh, the prison guard to hold on to his dessert, which was pecan pie, telling him he was gonna save it for later. Maybe not even aware what fate awaited him. Then we've got Victor Furiger, whose last meal request was simply an olive with the pit still in it. My portrayal of these final meals was just to offer another lens for us to be able to look at this heated topic of the death penalty. I'm not trying to condone what they've done or justify it or even make a larger statement about the death penalty in general. I'm just trying to show that at the base of it all, we're all still humans. Now, the green room couldn't be further from having a meal on death row. When a band or musician goes on tour, they have what's called a rider, which is a list of requests that stipulates how they want everything from their musical gear set up on stage to how they want the food to be catered before they go out to perform. In collaboration with fellow artist Caitlin Levine, we decided to recreate a bunch of these rider requests in the manner of Flemish still life paintings. <laughs> so we've got Frank Sinatra here. He wanted a booze buffet of seven kinds of alcohol, but with the old school addition of shrimp and cough lozenges. Axel Rose, he wanted Dom Perignon, but with white Wonder Bread. <laughs> all the trimmings of a rock star, but underneath it all, still a suburban kid from Indiana. Britney Spears, who had a kind of a common and a royal, or maybe even tragic request. She asked for McDonald's cheeseburgers with no buns and a portrait of Princess Diana. But what also interested us were the requests that kind of contradicted these musicians' public personas such as Marilyn Manson, who wanted gummy beers. <laughs> or the Foo Fighters must have had some fun when they asked for a kielbasa so immense it would make a grown man feel self-conscious. <laughs> Whether their tastes were high or low, it just the sidelight around these requests offered an interesting view for us to be able to see these people as real people, and also offer the viewer a kind of personal dining experience with the stars. But now today what's got me excited is the end of the world. Not that I'm excited for it to finish, but I'm really interested in the people who are planning for the end of time. In the US alone, there's over three million of them, the doomsday preppers. Mass destruction is their belief, whether it be something natural like a meteorite or an earthquake, or something man-made like biological warfare, financial collapse, or radical climate change. Tied to this belief is the fear that the food distribution system is gonna break. Now even FEMA recommends everyone should have at least three days of food on hand for a disaster. The preppers have taken this to the extreme. So I connected with a bunch of preppers from around America to talk to them about their Armageddon menus, which are all diversely designed based around their religions, their lifestyles, their locations, and just what they think is gonna happen on the back of this disaster. We've got Joshua who's worried about a whole series of terrorist attacks. He's actually an Orthodox Jew living in Pittsburgh, so his prep was two-tiered. The first, he's got the kosher. He's got matzo, 
rice, and MREs. MREs are meals ready to eat. They're lightweight and long-lasting. It's what you get often in the military if you're going out in the field. But the Toa also says that you can break any of these religious rules if your life depends on it. So he keeps a flock of unchristened rabbits in the backyard, which he's forbidden any of his children from naming so they don't get attached for when that fatal day arrives that they have to eat them. Wilma Bryant in Missouri, she and her daughter are worried about a series of tornadoes coming through and destroying their part of the country. Her and her daughter are also diabetic and insulin dependent. So their food prep has got to be low in carbs, high in protein, and with lots of insulin stored. Although, as I discovered, insulin, even when properly stored, will only last for six months. So their prep is also reliant on the medical system getting back up on its feet. Jason Charles, who was a New York City fireman and a responder to the 9-11 attacks. He's worried about a volcano going off in the Yellowstone National Park that's going to send an ash cloud up into the sky just like after 9-11, but of much, much more epic proportions. And he's basically planning on turning his New York apartment into a survival bunker, complete with MREs, ramen, and a water bob for the bathtub. Now, the Mormon faith actually encourages disaster preparedness. Colleen Bishop is a Mormon foodie. She has over $100,000 worth of food stored in her pantry, and she rotates it constantly for freshness. She thinks it's going to be a financial collapse coming. And when that happens, she doesn't want to compromise with the way she wants to eat. <laughs> She's also figured out ways to preserve her food for longevity, from waxing her cheeses, pickling her eggs, freeze drying, and vacuum sealing. She also wants to be able to cook everything from base ingredients and not have to deliver life of heating up pre-made things. Finally, we've got Rick Austin, who's essentially a self-sustainable farmer. He lives from the motto, plant once, harvest for a lifetime. Rick claims that he can feed him himself and his family indefinitely from their livestock, greens, fruits, nuts, and what they've preserved. Rick also claims he's actually never been healthier than since he's taken this lifestyle change. Now, the closer I observed these preppers, I was able to see the kind of brilliance in their planning. They weren't concerned with the granular details of the food industry that actually stepped back and saw that the, the food distribution system was actually the most delicate thing. I think so many of us take it for granted that there's just always going to be food turning up on our local grocery store shelves. But in any kind of disaster, the food distribution chain is the first thing to break. And these preppers just don't want to leave themselves vulnerable for when that time comes, or if it does. Now, I haven't shown you a single traditional portrait of any of the people that I've discussed today. But hopefully from their culinary choices, we're able to gain a deeper understanding of them as a person. And through that, we're able to see that food is actually a common language that's able to transcend geography and borders and world views. And that food really is a common tongue that all of us can speak. Thank you. <laughs>